they uh, decided to attend graduate school, how um, they funded it, what research they're looking into, how they connected to research opportunities. Um, we're happy to have you here today. This meeting is recorded, so if you um, feel like turning off your camera, feel free to do that. My name is Denise. I'm one of the advisors with RAMP. And uh, we'll have time at the end for questions and answers too. So if you have any questions, either for the whole panel or for individual panelists, feel free to raise your hand using the feature on uh, Zoom or type them into the chat or unmute yourself. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Daniel. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Daniel Chow. I guess I should, we should start with introductions first. So my name is Daniel Chow. I am not a graduate student, so <laughs> I probably don't have any business modeling this panel, but um, this isn't about me. So let's, I guess, go straight into introductions to about guests today. So I guess we'll start with um, Natalie. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Natalie. I am part of the English graduate program here at CPP. I'm doing uh, my primary option is in rhetoric and composition. My secondary option is in literature. And um, hopefully, fingers crossed, this is my last semester. Happy to be here. Thank you, Natalie. And, um, and next, can we start with Alexis? Hi, my name is Alexis. Um, I am an English rhetoric major here at the uh, Graduate School for Cal Poly. Um, with a secondary in literature. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm about halfway through my second semester. So it's been a, uh, an experience so far, good experience. Thank you, Alexis, glad to hear. Um, and after that, can we go with Paula? Hi everyone, um, my name is Paola and I'm also in the English grad program in Cal Poly. This is my last semester. And my primary option is uh, rhetoric and composition. And like Nat Natalie, my emphasis is in literature. Perfect. And after that, can we go with Rudy? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rudy. Uh, I'm a first year in the Mechanical Neurospace Engineering Program at UCI. Uh, my specialty is fluid dynamics. And um, like many of you, I used to be a RAM 2T for two years and then I worked as a tutor. And in fact, Daniel used to be my 2T. He was one of my last ones. So that's about me. It brings back old times. <laughs> and last but not least, can we go with Wayne? Hey, um, my name is Wayne Page. I'm a PhD student at Ohio State. Uh, my emphasis in, is in combustion and optical diagnostics. And I uh, actually used to be a RAM 2T and a tutor, uh, tutored for three years, was a 2T for one, and enjoyed the question. So the first question is for everyone on the panel. So consider some of your earliest notions of graduate school. What are some of the reasons you decide to attend grad school? Were there any specific individuals who helped you make that decision? And first we'll go, we'll start with Alexis. So my earliest notion of graduate school, so it was, it was this unachievable, unattainable, extremely hard thing that I had no business being a part of. It always was, a, it always just looked like a super difficult thing to be accepted to. I've heard these sort of like war stories of um, people way smarter than me uh, being rejected from all the graduate schools they, they applied to. That was kind of like my earliest notion, um, but it's it's absolutely not like that. Um, and the reasons I decided to go were, um, it was just kind of part of my personal goals for myself, um, first and foremost, um, you know, just sort of make my family proud and um, and just to get to where I want to be in my, my career, just to further my career. So those were sort of the reasons I wanted to. Um, as far as anyone who helped me with the decision, um, it's crazy because literally everyone who I ever talked to about the decision of what should I do after my bachelor's degree, um, you know, they would all tell me because, you know, I want to be a uh, English professor or anything to do with creative writing. Every single one of them would be like, oh, you have to be a, a high school teacher first. And so I was always like, ah, but I don't want to do that. Right. Like I want to be a college professor. 
and literally everyone one by one I would talk to you have to be a college have to be a, or have to be high school teacher high school teacher and teacher's credential so like I was weighing the op options between teacher's credential and just going right for my master's right after and I was always really unhappy with the idea that man I might have to do my teacher's credential first but it wasn't until a good friend of mine um, kind of told their friend my story and that person sort of said like oh well they should just go straight to their masters have you know they should just do what they want to do and for some it's so odd because it's like you know like six degrees of separation a friend of a friend was sort of like that deciding factor that i was like you know what i'm gonna go right for my master's degree perfect thank you so much for sharing and next can we have natalie um yeah so i'm kind of like alexis where graduate school seemed like this very unattainable thing that like super smart people did. So I never really thought of myself as um, going to graduate school, but um, I took some time um, after my undergraduate degree to then pursue a graduate degree. Um, so the reason why I did decide to pursue it was to and like improve my own professional um, career. Um, I, I work uh, in heavy editing. And so I thought, well, a master's degree in English could really help with that. Um, any kind of managerial positions in the institution that I work at requires a master's degree. So I thought, you know what, why not? Um, and to be honest, I didn't really tell anybody that I was applying. Um, what I did is I went straight to the graduate programs and I started talking to their advisors and their coordinators. And the person who really helped me was um, Dr. Smith, which is the coordinator for the English graduate program. I mean, without her, I wouldn't have even applied. So she's, she's the one person that I can really thank for really encouraging me to, to go ahead and to do that and for, you know, making me believe that I could. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's my jam. Sounds perfect. And next, can we go on to Paola? Okay, so um, my first notions of graduate school was, um, you know, it was just that something that I knew professors had told me and family had told me that a bachelor's degree was not um, was not really um, enough. That if I had a an, degree in English, that I it was really hard to find a job, and all of these things of like oh you you have to kind of thing, but all actually um, that was like the what people will tell me. But um, on my last semester in undergrad, I started um, looking for jobs in um, areas that were not education or teaching, and uh, I noticed that having a bachelor's degree was kind of in in the requirements to apply was kind of of a given like we you have you have to have the bachelor's degree that's kind of uh, what we expect and but what else what else can you offer what else did you study or, or what what else is your experience and um so i i knew it had to be uh the i, I had to go to grad school so it will maybe set set me apart from the competition and and give me more skills for um to to find connections in different jobs and in, in areas. Um, you know, a graduate program prepares you with resources and connections to have an easier time in the job market. And a special individuals that helped me in the program were um, professors who will, um, in the, my last year, they will ask, oh, what are you doing? Are you applying to grad school? These are some schools that you should go, or I, I went to the schools. Let me know if you want information or, or we can meet and uh, I can help you. Um, you know, find schools that you want to apply to or talk to you about the program. So professors. Thanks. Thank you for sharing, Paul. And next, can we go on to Rudy? Uh, hello. So like many of you, I didn't think I was going to grad school. Um, when I was in my undergrad, usually what I saw is as soon as you graduated from your bachelor's program, you started working full time. Um, after I graduated, I struggled finding full time employment. But instead of wasting time just applying for more jobs when it wasn't look when it didn't seem like it was going to go anywhere i decided like three months after i graduated i was going to apply for grad school so i started looking for programs and yeah here i am now it's honestly not as bad as i thought it was going to be it's pretty fun even though it's been virtual 
Thank you for sharing, Rudy. And last, can we go with Wayne? Yeah, so for me, graduate school, I mean, getting into college was kind of already a step that I didn't expect to do, at least in high school. And then graduate school from then on uh, was not a notion that I necessarily considered, especially early on. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a couple internships at, with NASA and where I got to do a lot of research-based oriented stuff. And then that was where I think some of my earliest notions, or at least my own thoughts, started forming. Although I kind of look back and there's some thoughts where um, different programs I was involved with, well, RAMP being one of them, and then uh, the engineering scholars program being another kind of drive you towards that research, research oriented. And so I think that's where they actually really started. But my earliest like real thoughts about it started um, when I started enjoying research when, when I was interning at NASA. Um, some more specific pe individuals that helped like really helped me uh, make my decision um, was one, one of my mentors at NASA Langley. He was um, actually kind of the person who guided me and I saw the path he took and was like, well, that's kind of the path I would like to take and set my goals on, on that uh, overall. Um, now I don't, but there was plenty of people in between who, who helped me. I wouldn't even say make my decision, but helped me. Um, cause once you make your decision, it was it, where to go from there. And so a lot of people helped me along the way, uh, from making that decision to, to getting where I'm at here. Thank you for sharing, Wayne. Um, so I guess we're going straight on to the next question. So the next question would be, think back to your first quarter slash semester in your graduate program. What stood out to you? If you faced an obstacle during your first quarter, how did you resolve it? And this question goes to Paola. Um, okay, so my first semester, um, so thinking back of my first semester, there was, there, um, I was shocked by the amount of work that was expected from me um, before entering the classroom. There, um, just so much homework without the usual grade, like you turn in something or you do all, all this work and then there's no, um, you don't have a, a grade for it. It's just part of, part of the process. And, um, what I mean is that each class will require you to do the readings and put the work before and attending the class. And at the beginning, I felt tempted to just show up and learn there. But I, I pretty quickly, I learned that half the learning uh, process had to happen on my own, but um, and, and at my own time before the class. But by the time you show up to class, you will come with questions, you come with ideas and things you don't understand so people can help your your professors can help you and your classmates can help you um and you know like i i know that i am in grad school because that's um that's where i want to be i i think a lot of um a lot of um you know in high school you have to do high school because you have to and um most of the time college your parents want you to be there and you know that you have to go to college but grad school you want to be there like I want to be there I know I'm paying for it I'm putting the time so if I want to get the most out of it I am the one who has to put all the the effort and and, and do it do it all the way no 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 just half the work um but so something that I like an obstacle that happened on those first semesters and how I I think I over came those obstacles where was just being disciplined, knowing that I had to actually sit down, do schedules and follow those schedules so work wouldn't feel overwhelming. Um, so having discipline and you, knowing that when you cheat yourself and do half the homework or the reading, you're the one who's going to aff be affected. Thank you, Paula, for the differentiation between undergrad and graduate programs. Um, and next we'll go on to Rudy with the same question. So my first quarter wasn't too long ago. It was actually this past fall quarter. And for me, it was a huge shock. Uh, mostly just to begin with, it was virtual. So uh, to begin with the material is pretty difficult and like the homework assignments are difficult too. But in undergrad, I, at least I had friends I could work with. Um, I didn't have that since it was everything's virtual. There was no one to meet in class. Um, I struggled at first. 
But then into my third week with my first fluids course, um, our midterm was about to be up and we were all rushing into the professor's office hours. And then that's when I discovered that um, I thought I was struggling, but I, I thought I was under the impression I was the only one that was struggling. I thought everyone else had like a good hand on the material, but that's not true. Everyone struggles. Like if you're, if you think you're doing bad in grad school, everyone's doing bad. Um, so we I eventually, because of that office hour meeting that I went to, um, I ended up making a discord group with some of the, the people in my class and I actually got to uh, make friends with them. And ever since then, we like to help each other in the homework and stuff. But yeah, the, the biggest struggle was that it was virtual. Um, and also the material is hard, but like the professors help you a lot. There's like a lot of help available to you. You go to the professor's office hours. Um, usually after class, they'll stay for like half an hour to go through like the homework problems in case of you, like you're struggling with it. They'll try to give you hints. They, they can't give you the full solution. You have to learn by yourself. Um, and then if the class is big enough, there's a TA and the TA is basically like a second professor. Like they'll be really helpful. Um, usually in my experience, it's on Fridays, the TA will have his own office hours. It'll be about an hour long and they're really knowledgeable. They really help you walk through the homework or whatever material you're not understanding. So it is a struggle because of the difficulty, but there's a lot of help available to you. Thank you for sharing, Rudy. This actually segues right into the next question. So the next question is, what type of learning and student experience were you seeking from graduate school? Have you received it? If you conducted research, how did you choose your faculty mentor slash advisor? And this goes straight back to Rudy. I, so going into grad school, I was expecting it to be difficult. I knew it was going to be more theory-based, more concept-based. Um, and yet that did end up being true. But what shocked me was like how the classes were like set up. Um, I was used to some of my like fluids courses. It was 25% quizzes, 25% midterm, 25% final, like a 10% project, and then something else will make up the majority of the grade. Now it's 40% midterm, 60% final. You get homework and you have to do it to study for the test, but it's not worth much. Like it's not worth anything at all. Um, so that I, I was I, like, I expected the material, but not like the homework difficulty. It, it was just a shock to me. Um, now it's I'm used to it. I know that if I struggle with it, I'll just get help. And in terms of research, um, I'm not doing any research. I'm, I'm doing the master's program, and oh. Um, So one of the things that um wait let's see first uh, can you move on to Wayne for a bit I have to I have some something going we'll, on quickly we'll move on straight into Wayne so Wayne can you take can you be back to me though yes we'll come back <laughs> uh yeah so for the learning and student experience I was kind of seeking that actually I guess goes back to something I left out for uh, why I considered grad school uh, which I, I have achieved or I, ha I have kind of obtained it uh, or received it is, is kind of the guided or the, the classes are more focused on what you're interested in. So it's been something that I think from each class, I find that I get more and more from that class because it has something to do with where I want to go and not necessarily this broad uh, depth that you go into as an undergrad. And I think I've achieved a lot of that. But then beyond that, I, I have done research, um, am doing research, um, and I mean, it's kind of required for the PhD, but um, it, that portion is actually what I really, really was looking forward to, because that's kind of my end goal is to work into a in research-oriented field. And so I, uh, the learning I've achieved from doing research and working with my advisor and others in my lab has kind of been um, the backbone behind all of it. Um, and so some idea of why, how I chose my advisor, um, I, I found someone who early on seemed like he was going to be an advocate for me. So actually from at, at Ohio State, I had submitted my application a little bit late, um, which meant I wasn't actually qual or it 
it was behind a deadline for qualifying for some financial aid packages. He went, uh, he contacted me, we had a discussion and he went ahead and submitted a package to try to get me back into that um, for that financial aid. And so I got, after that, I had talked to a number of professors at Ohio State um, about doing research and stuff with them. Um, and all of them were, it seemed like good choices, uh, very personal, but like I said, he, he was someone who came out and who went and seeked me out, had a discussion and then was advocating for me. So that's kind of how I chose my advisor. Perfect. So I guess we'll just go back oh. to Rudy if he's back. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I was expecting was to learn more of the material. There's some stuff that I learned in my undergraduate where the professor would always say, Oh, I could go on like 10 more weeks just on this one topic. We don't have time. So I was expecting to learn more in depth. And, and I am. Um, there's so much material to learn. It's really interesting. In terms of research, I'm not doing anything. I'm getting my master's and I'm doing the comprehensive, ex comprehensive exam option. So that means um, instead of doing research, I get to take more elective courses. And then towards next year, I'll be taking an exam. Um, so that's letting me take a lot of stuff that I, I really want to learn. Um, for example, next quarter, I'll be taking like a, a turbulence class. I really wanted to learn that. I also wanted to learn CFD. Um, it's computational fluid dynamics. I didn't get a really get a chance to learn it during my undergrad, but um, I'll be I'll have the opportunity next fall quarter to take it. So yeah, um, I didn't want to do research because I just wanted to take more electives and learn more of the material that I didn't get a chance to learn in my undergrad. Thank you for sharing, Rudy. And we'll go on to the next question after this. So did you attend grad, graduate school directly after completing your un, undergraduate degree? Why or why not? Looking back, would you make the same decision now? What would you recommend students do to make themselves more marketable to graduate programs? And we'll start with Natalie with this question. Um, thank you, Daniel. So I did not go to graduate school right after my undergraduate degree. I took a 14 year break. So I graduated, I did my undergraduate in graphic design. And at the time I didn't apply to graduate school because you didn't need to go to graduate school to get a job in graphic design. Um, so it's only through the winding road of life that I ended up here. <laughs> and I decided, I think now's the time for the graduate program, um, which is why I applied. Um, would I make the same decision now? Yes, because I didn't know at the time, you know, where things would take me. Um, so, um, so, so there's that. And then, um, what would I recommend to students to make themselves more marketable is I found that reaching out and speaking to people in the graduate program that you're thinking of applying to, like read who the faculty are in that program, read about their research, um, be curious about them, and then reach out to them because <laughs> the more you ask questions. First, you're learning more about whether or not that program is right for you, um, but also what you're going to get out of that program. And learning about the professors in that program are really going to help you um, understand what to expect. But also, depending on how the admissions process is, sometimes those professors are going to be sitting there reading your application. So if your name stands out to them, that's even better for you. They've already had a conversation. They know that you're interested and that you're curious. You're not just gonna be another name in the application file. You've actually taken the time to really make sure that this is where you wanna be. So that's kind of one thing that I would recommend you do. Thank you for sharing, Natalie. Um, I think those are wonderful tips. And we'll send this question over to Alexis. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I did attend graduate school right after my bachelor's degree. Um, and I did it mainly because my first uh, college in attempts in general were, was just like a complete failure of attempts. Um, back then I was mainly going to college for my parents. 
right? So it, it was this idea where I had no motivation to do it for myself. It was just like, oh, they always wanted me to go. I guess I'll do it, right? And that's never a good idea just because, you know, my, my early college transcripts are a result of that, right? I like to tell everyone that I, you know, I got that 10-year AA degree just because it took so long to, to get the AA and transfer out of there. But, uh, but yeah, because of that, that was kind of part of the motivation um, because after passing my first few semesters, um, that's when I just never looked back. And I, I had decided pretty early on, like, I'm going to go all the way to the end if I can. Um, so would I make that decision again? Absolutely. And for me, my motivation is because um, not that I wasted the time early on. Uh, I was always, I was doing like other stuff as far as my passion for writing at the time that that still kind of like took up that time but I would do it all over again just because um just because I'm, I'm you know older now and, and I, I want I wanted to uh, just dive right into the master's program um and one recommendation that I would have to look more marketable for uh grad admissions is um just give your most honest responses in your apps your cover letters etc everything get just make sure that they um, cause you know, everyone has a unique story, um, to tell, and you just got to make sure to tell your story. Uh, when you tell your story, that's another way to stand out because there's no one else like, uh, like you. And, um, and to be honest, I feel like that's probably why I was accepted just because I was very honest about my horrible college start, but I was also honest that, you know, there's no way I'm ever going back to that. So, um. Thank you for sharing, Alexis. And lastly, can we go to Paula for this question? Yeah. Okay, so I I did attend grad school right after undergrad. I I knew that I had a good rhythm going on. Like I felt like kind of comfortable on, you know, with classes, talking to professors, doing homework and doing my things until like maybe like the last half of this last semester of undergrad and I was like okay if I take a break maybe I'll forget how to study and read and do homework and talk to people so I'll just do it right away um I I I, I knew that you have to apply I think one year before so I I wanted to do it right away I didn't want to um I didn't want want to just not having to, to go through the process of coming back because I felt like it would have been hard for me. I know that's not the case for everybody, uh, but I, I do know that it's, it's also the case a lot, a lot of times for first generation students, um, you might have family or, or a support system that it, if you're the first one doing it, then there's a lot of questions of, of why, why um, how the process goes. And there's gonna be the, the maybe, hopefully not comments of, but I thought you were done already, or um, isn't it time to go find a job already? Or when are you going to be done? And um, my hope is that, you know, your family and friends are going to understand that what's best for you is to pursue your education and your passions. And at, at the end, that's what matters the most. But if that's not the case, you know, you need to do this for you and, and you need to, I, I, fe I feel like, I think, Time is gonna pass anyway, so it's gonna. This our program in Cal Poly for English is two years. Most I think most master's programs are two years, and the, that's four semesters that flew by. And I don't know how I'm in the last semester, and I know that that's gonna be you know um, the the pro hopefully the case for you because you're going to be studying something you care about and something that that really you know you you you. Or it's building what you already love. Um, one recommendation I have for students to be more marketable to grad programs, it's confidence that in your personal statement, in your essay for, uh, to apply, and also um, your interviews, you have to be confident that you already did the work, you already have the, grad, the, the, the bachelor's, you are, you know what you know, and, and you're passionate about it. You need to make it seen in your applications and your essays and your interviews that you have a plan that you are going to finish and that you are going to, um, you know, be be passionate about what you're going to do. You you so that way, people um, looking at your application, they they know they're not wasting your spot. 
that when if they let you in in the program, you are going to be there, you are going to do a great work, and you are going to finish. Because, you know, you already um, sometimes like I remember going to a panel when I was um, thinking of grad school, and people were telling were saying, well, you should be president of the club and you should do, um, you know, be part of the student government and, and write for the newspaper and do all these things that it was too late for me it was the last semester in, in, in undergrad. So I just think that you need to be confident that you already did the best work that you could and then you need to let them know that yes, you want me in your program because I'm going to finish and I'm going to be my best there. Um, I think that 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 will, you know, put you in the front of a lot of people who are just maybe, maybe thinking about it. Thank you for, for the advice, Paola. I think it's a very good advice. And it, it actually directly leads to our next question. So our next question is about imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome is defined as a psychological pattern in, in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and has persistent internalized fears of being exposed as a quote unquote fraud. Please describe your experience with imposter syndrome and how you managed or overcame it. And we'll send this to Alexis. Yeah, so uh, I was able to sort of evade imposter syndrome for a long time just because um, I've already been at the lowest of the lows in the college world with just literally failing courses at the beginning to actually transferring to a four year university and getting my bachelor's degree. So I was, I was able to like really not worry about it, but I, I have experienced a little bit of it here and there in grad school. Um, but the way I uh, like navigate around that is just be yourself. And then that's kind of like what I always try to remind myself is just to be myself. Um, Cause there's, there's going to be some intelligent people in, in grad school. Right. And they're going to be, super intelligent sounding. They're going to use words. They use words that I've never heard in my life. And then the professors will respond with those words and saying, oh, you're absolutely right. And then like kind of going back and forth with the lingo, right? But I'll also, so so I like to take these rhetorical theories that are pretty complex in, in our readings that we always have to do. And I like to try to, okay, break it down and see like, okay, well, if I had to explain this into terms where I could explain it to my family, to my neighbors, like how would I do that? And so I like to kind of break those theories down that way. And then those are sort of the responses I give my professors. And just like they did with the intelligent people, they, uh, they, my professors will also go with me and, and say like, oh yeah, that's right too. That's absolutely right. So, so I say that to say that there's both ways to do it, right? Um, just because uh, I have like one experience with a, a final project where we had to do like peer review. And one of these intelligent people were reviewing my project and they just tore it up, right? From top to bottom. And I, I was like, okay, rude. Um, so, but then like, I, I thought to myself, okay, well, you know what? Like I'll, I'll take some of that and change it, but um, I'll, I'll more so stick with the professor's comments and maybe do some of the improvements that I was already going to do. And sure enough, when I revised it, I was very happy with that course grade and you know, I passed the class and I'm sure that person also passed the class. So there's, you can do it both ways. So you don't have to be, um, the intelligent sounding person if that's not you and if it is then you know more power to you so just just know that imposter syndrome is only um sort of like a mind state that when, once you realize like oh i could get by with my way too um then you'll be absolutely great thank you for that anecdote alexis i think it's a very powerful one and after this we'll go on to natalie so um imposter syndrome for me is very real, like happening right now. <laughs> so in my last semester of grad school, I still have the thoughts like rearing their ugly heads. Um, so, I mean, like I said earlier, I didn't tell anyone I was applying to a grad school because I didn't want to tell them that I didn't get in because that was part of my imposter syndrome. <laughs> I didn't want to feel like you know, a failure or like a loser to, to other people in my life. So after I did get in, I was like, whew, okay. Um, so how I'm going to reread. So my experience with imposter syndrome, and it happens every semester, is that I'll start off going like, like Alexis. I'm like, okay, what is this word that so-and-so used? Or I'll walk out of a class and just ask myself like, what did we just talk about? I, I had no idea what concept that was. Um, 
But one way to, to really change that mindset that I found is to just be really self-aware. And like the minute that negative thought creeps into my head, I have to then identify that that is a negative thought. Like, you know, Paula and I, we are right now working through our portfolios and I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? And I'll start like doing the negative talk, like, oh no, they're going to see me for who I am. I passed all these classes and I've, you know, I've been a fraud this whole time only to look back and go, oh my gosh, no, you passed these classes and you did really well in all of them. So why are you even having these thoughts? So it's, it's almost like trying to bring reality and looking at the facts rather than the thoughts that are like running through my brain half the time. And that's just what really helps me. Um, it's still, I have not overcome it. I don't think I ever will. It's just this constant like barrage of, oh, wait a minute, that's not right. You can do this. And this is evidence that you have done it in the past. And so it's kind of this balance. So that's, that's my experience at least. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I, I think um, imposter syndrome plagues, I would say plagues, plagues most of us. But lastly, we'll go on to Paula. So I think Natalie and Alexis already said, you know, a, a lot of great points. This is the same thing. It's happening to me. And this is the thing about imposter syndrome. It's you, you feel like you don't belong and you feel that you're the only one who is a fraud and cheating everyone and making everyone believe that you know what you're doing when you don't. But the thing is that soon enough, you find out if you if you have you know you talk to others that you're not the only one feeling that way. Uh, for me, it was it it was a struggle because I um um I am anemic and a lot of a lot of my my first generation um, friends that I have uh, in grad school and in undergrad they they were born here from um, you know Latino families or or families from other parts of the world. But for me, I'm I'm the, I'm the one who came from another country, and I had to learn English when I was older. I was I was 19 years old, and um, just going through the you know going through college, trying to learn English at the same time was just really tough. And and every day I still you know I keep saying I'm still learning English, and it's not believable anymore because you know I have a, a under a bachelor's in English, but it's still a feeling of I'm still learning. I'm still, I'm still, I don't know everything. I don't know anything. And in my classes, it's tough because it's, um, it's a constant um, struggle, struggle with yourself of, I, I don't know how to do this. I have no idea what's going on. So I think the best way to overcome this is to talk to people. Uh, Rutilio said that this earlier about having a group chat, having the discord, channel and having connections with with friends that so you can complain about all your pain and suffering and you can uh go through it together because you when you when you tell someone else i don't get this and this is so hard and the other person goes me too this is so so much i haven't started it or i don't know how to start it then you you you're like okay well we're going through the same thing maybe you know and there and you look up to them then they're probably looking up to you and you, you, you'll you find ways to just get through it. I think um, like, for example, Natalie, I don't think if she remembers this, but um, my first orientation, my first semester of grad school, I talked to her and, and I was like, I should run out of the door because I will never be as smart as Natalie ever in my life. And um, then, you know, I had her in a class and then we talked and then it's been, you know, a process of getting through things together and, and, and we're getting there, we're gonna do it. Uh, but it's, you have to remind yourself that, you know, you're not alone, you're not the first one and a good affirmation to tell yourself at all times as a first generation student is you already got yourself, yourself to the point where you are, you're already here. So if you you have the skills, you have the knowledge, you just have to have the confidence in your the confidence in yourself that you can do it. I think that that will help. Thank you, Paula. I feel like I'm listening to like a motivational speech. But <laughs> so next, next we we'll move on to um, money essentially. So um, the next question is, what recommendations do you have for financing? Uh, graduate education. And this goes to Natalie. 
So um, I have a, a very different experience. And so I'm gonna talk about a little more unconventional ways to finance your graduate education or just ways that you may have not even thought about. I mean, yes, there's financial aid. Yes, there's student loans, but um, I work at another CSU. And I'm not sure if you know this, but if you work at a CSU, you actually, as an employer, employee, get a waiver to go to school. So I have my workplace paying for up to six units of courses in a program. And that has helped fund my graduate education. So, um, so I, I, wrote, I wrote a few things here. So when you're looking to fund if, or find ways to funding things, definitely look into scholarships. So I work at another CSU and I hear from faculty all the time that so-and-so scholarship just didn't get funded this year because nobody applied. So apply because you never know if you're going to get funded. Second is um, if you are planning on working, try to work someplace where they do have um, benefits for uh, people who want to go to school. So like Best Buy has programs for, here's a keyword, um, tuition reimbursements or tuition waivers. Um, if you do plan on working and going to grad school at the same time, most grad schools are designed for the working individual. So chances are the classes take place at nighttime or during off hours. And that way you can work if you should choose so. Um, and another thing is to look into graduate assistantships. And those are essentially positions at universities. So what you would do is you would apply to the program, get accepted, and then get accepted via a graduate assistantship where they would pay your tuition <laughs> while you're working in the graduate assistant job. So um, I think like, I think, I'm not sure if the TA programs here have that, but um, so I wanted to, to mention those things because there are institutions and workplaces that will help pay for your education. And that's not really something people think about. I didn't realize it till I started working at another CSU. You know, I know people who've worked at USC and they don't have to pay a cent for their graduate program. So, which is amazing, right? <laughs> so, um, and it's not just for yourself, you could do it for your spouse, you could do it for any dependents if you want to. So just something to think about that's a little more unconventional than the standard. Thank you for sharing that. I actually didn't know that either, but um, so can we go with Wayne for this question as well? Oh, most definitely. Um, so I, for at least the way I funded it, I, I went into grad school or applying to grad schools, pretty much telling myself that I was going to only go to grad school if I could get it financed. Um, so I uh, applied to eight different schools, which um, they, so I, I, some of them I got financial offers in terms of forms of like a GRA ship. So that's a, like a resource assistance and ship, um, which some schools do very well with that. Um, and some schools don't give that good of offers in terms of stuff like that. Um, and then GTAs, graduate teacher, same thing um, in terms of that. Uh, typically, a lot of those, at least at least at Ohio State, so speaking from that background, is typically to come into that position, you have to be at the university first. Um, I've been fortunate enough, so the university had its own fellowship. Uh, so I came in with the offer, if I didn't get the fellowship, that I would get a GRA um, through my advisor. And then I was fortunate enough to get this fellowship that lasted my first year. Um, and then the department offered some supplement to that because um, mechanical engineering or depart in aerospace engineering departments offer some, they like to be more competitive. So they offered a supplement to that. And then from there, um, since my funding was going to be kind of ending or going kind of down from there, um, I applied to a number of national fellowships, um, which I, I, at least as a, I mean, you definitely, most definitely should be applying to. Um, there a lot are based on STEM, but I know there's quite a few that are also aren't. Um, and obviously I have to do it based on this, the STEM. So I was fortunate enough like then in my, this, this last year to get the NDSE and NDSEG fellowship, which is a fellowship funded through the DOD. Um, so that's kind of how I funded it. And that's kind of my recommendations in terms of funding it is looking through those 
those avenues for things. Now, those are probably a little bit more, like she said, uh, these are more conventional. These are the typical routes that you'll hear uh, when applying um, and talking to the schools. And then, and so that's kind of how I decided to go, what grad school I'd go to is based uh, a little bit based on, okay, what school am I not going to have to pay any money for? So. Okay. Thank you, Wayne, for sharing that. And since we're running a bit low on time, so we'll, we have one more question. One more question for the panelists. Um, so this question is: What skills did you develop in undergrad that helped you succeed in graduate school? How does the course work differ from undergrad to graduate school? And we'll, we'll take like some like one liners or maybe short answers for these questions. Yeah. So Wayne, can you give us like a little short answer? Uh, the skills we developed. I mean, pretty much anything everything you learning studying and everything in between has really moved translated from undergrad to graduate school now you form that more so in graduate school and then that in how you form that is through the difference in your coursework um, like i said early on is i like my grad i i like the focus to the classes i'm taking where before there wasn't this focus and i take on to that and that's where i find the biggest difference um, Classes are a little bit harder, um, but you take less classes. Um, so I, I feel like that kind of balances some of that out. But the big portion that I've enjoyed the most is that focus. Thank you, Wayne, for sharing that. And Rudy, can you give us a, a short keyword answer for um, the last question? Yeah, in terms of the coursework, um, and like if you go to lecture, it's pretty much like what you'd expect from an engineering lecture. You go in there, take notes and stuff. But in terms of the homework, it's extremely difficult. Um, you might get per class one through seven, uh, five through seven problems a week. Um, some of them you'll be able to do by yourself. There's some where you'll have no idea how to do it. You'll ask your friends, they'll have no idea how to do it. You'll go to the office hours of the TAs, they'll help you get it, get it started. But then you'll get stuck. You, you'll have no idea how to proceed. Your friends will have no idea how to proceed. But then uh, usually after the week's up, the professor will, he'll, in the class, he'll go through the solutions um, and he'll walk you through it. And it's like, oh, this is what I was supposed to do. It wasn't actually that hard. I just needed to make that connection. And for me, when I took my first test, I was worried. I mean, if it took me like, a, like so many hours to do the homework, I might gonna be expected to take a test in like two hours, but it's okay. They, the professors know the, the materials hard so then they'll the problems will be like simpler versions of what you see in the homework and it's very doable and in terms of grading uh they try to give you as many points as they can um if they saw that you had the right approach they'll give you the points um unless you like I ha had no idea what to do with, like obviously they won't give you any points and yeah there's like you'll get help even if you struggle there's a lot of help you go to the professors your friends or the TAs. And in terms of skills, I'd say the big, big, big one that I learned at Cal Poly was time management. I know that's something that Ramp likes to talk about. If I know my homework's gonna take me so many hours to complete, um, you know, like I'll set, set time aside each day to do it. So if I have three classes and they're each giving me about five to seven problems to do, I'll do one problem per each class per day. That way it doesn't pile up and I'm not feeling over, overwhelmed. And that gives me time once the professor get, like posts the solution, so I could redo my homework and then prepare for the test or quizzes. And another one is just asking for help. I know sometimes it's like, it might make you feel dumb or like you're not good enough if you have to ask for help. That's not true. Um, if you're struggling, everyone's struggling. Um, definitely ask the, ask the professor for help. I know sometimes it could be a little intimidating going to their office, but they're pretty nice people. Like they really like to help. Uh, they really want to ha um, help you succeed. So, you know, if you need help, ask for it. Perfect. So thank you, Rudy. So that's, that's all the questions that we have lined up for today. And we just wanted to, I guess, um, leave everyone off with like a quick one-liner or a takeaway message for everyone. So I guess we'll go, we'll start with Natalie um, for the first takeaway. Quick, well, I was just trying to think of one. Um, I would say just, just, just be open and be, be confident to, to the experiences that life is going to throw your way, and just um, be. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? 
Um, well, anyways, I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, we'll go with Alexis after this. Yeah, so just kind of like my closing remark would be uh, just decide on a path that you love, uh, a path or paths if you're still a little bit undecided. Uh, just decide on, on what you love and just go for it because um, that, that's what helped me make my ultimate decision for graduate school. Perfect. And next we'll go with the motivational speaker, Paula. Um, one thing that I think it's very important to always know is that whatever time and money you invest in, in your education, it's going to be worth it. Thank you, Paula. And then next we'll go with Wayne. My primary recommendation, or all right, a little on one-liner would be, uh, for one, it's never too early to start thinking about it um, or preparing for it. Um, but it's also really never too late either. Um, even if you have to take a year off to prepare, um, there's really nothing like nothing wrong with that. You'll find um, there's plenty of diversity in the paths that people come to grad school. Um, I even think so more so than there was for students who get, got to their undergrad. So you'll find plenty. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at, or what I'd like to say. Thank you, Wayne. And last but not least, we'll just end it off with Rudy. So if you want to do grad school, but you kind of don't want to because it's difficult, I think you should do it. Yes, it's difficult, but at the end, you're, you'll be a better person for it. And again, if you're in my position where you didn't know what to do after graduation, um, I think you should apply, especially right now because of the pandemic. Uh, I know my program, they pushed the deadline to May 15th. I think that's like two months. That's plenty of time to fill out your applications, ask for recommendation letters. So it's never too late to apply. If you want to do it, do it. Um, if you don't want to do it because you're scared that you might fail, you won't know until you try. Thank you, Rudy. So this uh, ends our question and then it sends us right into our Q&A. But if we understand if you, you have, if you uh, kind of need to go to the next class, another class, um, you can go ahead and, and exit and thank you for coming. But if you want to ask some questions, um, please feel free to stay and ask whether you want to unmute your mic or put it in the chat, go, um, go ahead. We'll give you a couple, couple minutes to think. So I actually have a few questions for um, Wayne. And I myself, um, I'm interested in applying for Ohio State um, with the environmental department. And first off, I wanna see your experience, like how is the Buckeye State treating you? And then second, um, I think one of my interests in applying there is also like funding because they have the NSF NRT fellowship program. So um, just any advice you have. Well, uh, I have to mute myself first. Um, I love Columbus. Um, Ohio itself can be uh, an interesting place to, to live, uh, but Columbus, I, I find myself well at home uh, in Columbus uh, for, for sure. So at least in the campus life um, is good um, and, and everything in between. Now for applying for fellowships, for one, I mean, there's, so my early, especially for the NSF, um, as long as you're an undergrad, you, you should definitely apply, uh, once, um, in your undergrad, even if you don't think you're going to get it, you don't, you have no idea what you're going to come up with, uh, for applying for it. My recommendation was do it because they give you, if I remember correctly, um, and you, you may have been researching some of this, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you get one chance in your undergrad and then they give you one extra chance in your, uh, uh, kind of graduate degree, um. And then, so like I said, you may as well take your chance at the undergrad. Um, it doesn't hurt. Um, and then once you get there, uh, besides just when I got this last, this, the new fellowship that I applied for, I'd also applied for NSF and I got through, they have a number of steps associated with it. Um, so I, I had gotten through some portion of it. Um, the nice thing is also once you're in a grad degree, if you've picked an advisor early on, you, you can use your advisor for helping formulate that. And they're gonna be kind of your best resource. 
um, for formulating what to write for the NSF fellowship or any other kind of fellowship. Uh, but you definitely can go um, eat, talk, have other people look it over. I've had, I had like four or five people look over um, my uh, NDSCG and other fellowships this past, like I well, I've applied for fellowships all, all three years I've been here. So um, I've, had, I've gone over this a new, numerous amounts of times, having more eyes look at it, even if they don't understand what you're saying, they can at least fish out some of those uh, um, grammar mistakes, spelling mistakes, or just come up with better ways to word things. Also, if you do plan on, uh, if you want my email, I could give you always more information on Columbus and such forward to, or any other things more specific to Ohio State, so. Thank you, Wayne. Yes, that, that would be helpful. Oh, okay. I have a question for Natalie. Um, what do you recommend to someone or for someone who's going or working full time and doing grad school? Like balancing that and just the responsibilities in addition to any other you know, commitments to family, friends? Um, I'm not gonna lie, it's really hard. Um, so, you know, you have your nine to five and then during the semester, the maximum amount of courses that I was even able to take were two courses per semester. Um, and because I was doing two different uh, program options, I would definitely take one rhetoric course and then one literature course because two rhetoric courses is so much theory that like you're still trying to like figure out what it is that you've even read. Um, a lot of it is just really time management and really giving up your weeknights and weekends. I mean, like, I just, I haven't seen my friends in a while. <laughs> and once a semester starts, I tell my family, like, I'm not gonna be able to come on weekends because they're up in LA. Like, I can't spend two hours on the road because that'll help me go through a chapter and take notes, right? So it's a lot of just discipline and just knowing and realizing that it takes time and I do at every semester, whatever vacation I've built up from work, I'll take it off uh, to prep for finals. I'll take a full week off to just do finals. It's not my ideal vacation, but I'm working towards something. Like this, this is my time. And if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna get it done. And so it, that's my commitment. Um, and you know, family always ask, is it done yet? Is it over? When are you gonna get done so we can see? It's like, guys, just, relax, everyone goes through this. People who go to law school go through this when they study for the bar, right? People who go to medical school do this when they go through their board exams. So it's just, yeah, just have to be vigilant and set your boundaries and, and just get it done. <laughs> I hope I've answered your question. Sorry, I went off in a little tangent. No, definitely, yeah, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, if you think of something, you can always email us at ramp at cpp.edu. And I wanna thank our panelists again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we did run over a little bit of time, so we appreciate you all staying on and um, sharing your stories with our participants. And I wanna thank our um, moderator, Daniel, too. So we can put little like celebration or copied emoji reactions. Thank you for helping others prepare for grad school by sharing what you went through and how you're succeeding. And good luck to all of you panelists who are finishing up this semester. That's so exciting. Um, you're always welcome to check in with us. And um, if you want to come back and talk to us about how, you, how you're doing once you enter your professional career um, or move on, we'd be happy to help have you again. So thank you, all of you. If you have any questions, um, you can email us. I'm typing it in the chat. And we hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye.